The International Festival of Arts and Ideas is created and produced on the traditional lands of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pawgusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, in the land we all call home, Connecticut. We hope that from wherever you are, you take a moment to acknowledge and honor the native people whose land you are on and the history of the place you are in. The International Festival of Arts and Ideas stands in solidarity with black and brown communities and other groups who are targeted and abused by unjust systems of oppression. We support all movements working to decenter white voices and dismantle white supremacy. We are actively seeking to dismantle systemic racism and we raise our voices with those in our community who are already engaged in this vital work. We commit to working alongside you to create transformative change in New Haven and in our global community. Good evening, and welcome to Honoring Our Bodies, A Future for All Abilities, part of the 26th Annual International Festival of Arts and Ideas. This event is made possible thanks to the generous support and partnership of Connecticut Humanities and Connecticut Public, as well as the festival's marquee sponsors and donors throughout the community. My name is Beverly Kidder. I work at the Agency on Aging of South Central Connecticut, and I am the vice president there. And I am also vice president on the State Independent Living Council, an organization that works with organizations who work with people with disabilities. And we are thrilled to be here with you today. Uh, I was excited to introduce this discussion with these amazing leaders from the disability community. As we all imagine and build the future of our communities, it's critical that we listen and learn from people with disabilities. Especially after the past year taught us how possible it is to shift the way we work and live, if only we have the courage and fortitude to center true accessibility for all. 
It's my pleasure to now introduce Lucy Gelman, who will moderate the panel and introduce our speakers. Please use the YouTube and Facebook chat to talk to one another and to ask questions, which the panelists will address. Thank you so much for such a beautiful intro, Bev. It's, it's hard for me to follow that already. I want to waste absolutely no time in getting into this. I'm Lucy Gelman. I'll be moderating tonight's discussion, and I'm extremely excited to have three wonderful panelists with me tonight. I'd like to bring up Saray, a poet, writer, and essayist, and I'm going to ask the tech powers that be to put the link to his book, Slingshot, which I believe won the 2020 Lambda Literary Award and is a brilliant book. I'm, I'm going to try not to drop any F-bombs during the, the panel, but it's a brilliant book. And um, if, if they can put that in the chat, I'm also going to pull up Claudia Alec. They are the founding executive producer of Calling Up, among many, many other hats. And we are going to talk about that during the, uh, the panel. And I'd like to pull up Crystal Emery. Crystal is a producer, author, filmmaker. I would add, I'm very proud to share New Haven with her. And she is the founder and CEO of URU, The Right to Be, Inc. Before we go any further, I would like to do an access check-in. If you don't know what an access check-in is, you're, you're about to learn. So I am Lucy, I will be moderating tonight's discussion. And I have a traumatic brain injury, which means that sometimes the right side of my body says, nope, not today. I'm gonna pass it over to Claudia. Thank you so much. I um, have a muscle disorder and I'm actually having a little bit of a flare today. So you might see me pull a face. I'm very rarely pulling a face. It's something in the conversation and pulling a face because my muscles are pulling me. Um, other than that, my access needs are met. And, um, and I will lean back and let anybody else speaks who wants to. Saray, let's uh, pop it over to you. Sure. Hi, I'm Sari Drill Johnson. Um, I use he/him pronouns. Um, I have systemic lupus, erythematosus, which leaves me with a fair amount of pain. Um, I met my access needs um, on, on that regard. Before that, um, I do also have an autism spectrum disorder and some facial tics, um, but my needs are pretty well met right now. Beautiful and Crystal. Uh, you know, that's a funny question, right? So, uh, I, I guess my needs are met, or am I supposed to tell you my obstacles are? No. I don't even know, but here we go. Uh, I was an able-bodied person, and now I'm a differently able-bodied person. Uh, I am considered a quadriplegic. Although my mind and brain is not sure exactly what the hell that is. Uh, I am on a ventilator to help me breathe. And I guess all my access needs are made in this moment. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I want to get right into it. I also want to remind anyone out there listening, I'm just imagining that uh, there are hopefully hundreds of people listening to this discussion. Um, and I want to remind you that if you don't think I introduced the panelists sufficiently enough, Google is your friend. All of them are easily searchable. So Claudia, I've been thinking a lot about um, the concept that you talk about called supremacy culture and how before we get into envisioning a future for all abilities, we have to set a baseline and talk about where we are, even though that may not be a happy topic. For me, it is not a happy topic. And so I want to ask all of the panelists, and I'm gonna start with you, to talk a little bit about where we are right now and specifically within within the arts. And I would love for all of you to talk about what, what you're seeing in your medium so then we can imagine and uh, and and really, you know, look at what the world could be. I love an invitation to set a baseline before we imagine excitingly into what we can and should be doing. I love it. I use the term supremacy culture primarily because I'm on Twitter all the time 
and saying the very long and gigantic sis, uh, sentence of hetero racism, white supremacy, uh, uh, heterosexism, patriarchy, uh, um, ableism, that long sentence, I summarized as supremacy culture because I see them all as sort of um, collaborative systems um, that are aimed to keep power and resources in the hands of a very few and keep them away from me and also to disrupt my ability to be a cultural producer. And the baseline is the pandemic was a very big shift mm. in resources and power. And the shift was not down. The shift was up. There was a gigantic theft that took place in the last year and a half. Um, so the baseline is we're more aware of really good ways of doing things, but also we have less resources right now as a community. I'll stop talking and let someone else talk. Uh, Crystal, let's uh, let's go over to you, please. You know, I, I like that term, right? Um, that term works. I'm not sure, and I'm only speaking about my personal experience. What I do, I was born to do, right? So I wrote and directed my first play in fifth grade. COVID-19 was actually a big hindrance to me in a really big way. Um, even though being in a wheelchair, using a wheelchair, gets always difficult. For me, it was not being able to interact with other people in my space. Yeah. So I could create and all of the other things that I had been doing really didn't change. But that person to person, that interaction um, was much more difficult. But coming from the place of the, what did you call it again? Can you say that? Uh, Claudia uh, calls it supremacy culture. And I, I would say I totally agree with that. Um, so I, the I think supremacy that's, yeah. culture was not designed for me to succeed. Yes. Ever. So mm. my thing with the supremacy culture is I can't play the game by your rules because they were not designed for me to succeed. So therefore, I had to create a space for me to do me and do it well. And so all of those obstacles, look, I have a resume that is like freaking amazing. And I'm not saying it just because it's mine, but nobody in Hollywood will hire me on a set because as a quadriplegic, they feel that I'm a liability. Okay. And that hasn't changed, right? So. We look at all of these women that Ava and Oprah can put behind the camera, but nobody's going to quite the legion going behind that camera. Yeah. Right? So my struggle hasn't changed, but on the other side of that, I am not going to allow somebody else's definition of my capableness to keep me from doing what I'm doing. But I love that term. I might have to borrow it. So, and Saray, you know, as as far as setting a baseline, I I want to go to you, and then I also want to ask about how y'all are encountering it in in your work specifically. Um, but Saray, I'd love to know from you. You know, what's the baseline that you are seeing? As as you're imagining, I mean, I so in your work, you I think articulate word worlds that are worlds that exist in the present and also worlds that are possible. Um, and, and I'm wondering what, you know, what is that present of limitations perhaps that you're seeing? Yeah. Um, I really like the term supremacy culture as well, Claudia. Um, you know, I, I am overeducated at this point and, you know, the term that people have offered me that I think is actually a pretty corny term is the hierarchy. I think supremacy culture is much better way to say it. Mm. <laughs> it's a, so you can have the discussion with other people, you know, just like people out and about in the world who live lives that are, uh, you know, and maybe do not have a subscription to the New Yorker. So um, yeah, I think that that's a great term. I will absolutely use it and of course credit you because um, 
by training, although I no longer work in this field, I am a librarian. So um, citation, it will be done. Um, in terms of baseline, I think that one of the biggest barriers is celebrityism itself, mm. right? I think that so often there's a desire, and there was a desire in me too, you know, growing up to see uh, an autistic celebrity, to see, oh, you know, to say, oh, this celebrity has lupus, to be able to like rattle off a list of living people who had mm -hmm. um, an experience with disability that was similar to my own. But I think that the thing about celebrityism is that it keeps us from our collective work um, by pitting us against each other um, in really significant ways. And I don't just think that like, you know, I think that sometimes uh, people who are pat on the back because they're doing good work get like treated like they are celebrities by that kind of discourse for want of a better term, right? Like just because you have a large following or because you have received accolades doesn't mean that you're behaving as a celebrity. Um, I think that like the idea that some people uh, can do no wrong and if other people do the same thing, they will be punished. That's what I mean when I say um, celebrity culture. So um, like the desire, even the desire for like representation, you know, like as if representation is like coherent. Um, mm. That actually, you know, again, you know, I'm autistic and, you know, like there's so much conversation about diagnosis as if like self-diagnosis is gonna free us, you know, like from something. Um, and is there, if there's no downside, um, uh, I think that all of those kinds of things are um, factors that have sort of ballooned in quarantine because it, it's given people a lot of time to kind of atomize their own opinions of their own lives and mm. internally. I don't think there's anything wrong with that in and of itself. I mean, I've been, I was alone for a full year, you know, I celebrated two birthdays um, in quarantine. Um, I did not have a pod. Um, because my folks are far away and, you know, my last living, loving family member died. So um, it's been a difficult time. Um, and I can see, I mean, as it's been for most people, I want to say. Um, but when I think about, like, what happened, um, you know, thinking about disability justice specifically and how we can see that it's becoming very watered down in the wake of COVID because disabled people we're fighting for our lives for the past year and a half um, and finally got some traction. So people figure that it's a pretty marketable, marketable time to have disability justice, but with a more acceptable face and without the accessibility mm. that is the floor of disability justice. Um, and I've seen a lot more of those conversations come up in art spaces. Um, you know, I've had those conversations specifically about um, an anthology that was supposed to be published, it will still be published. Um, I guess um, that, you know, featured disabled editors, but was not accessible even in the baseline. People wanted to go back and forth about it. Um, and I think that that, to me, is like the state of where disability justice and art is, is that everything but the burden, anything mm. about us, definitely without us, as acceptable as you can be, people don't want it in their face. They don't want to know that you're disabled. They don't want to see a mobility aid. They don't want to have to provide accessibility. They just want the next new thing. And that is celebrityism, right? Anything that can get you on is what you're going to do. So um, I think that we have to protect. I mean, it depends on where you sit in the movement, whether or not you think disability justice is a movement. Um, and that's something I've noticed a lot. Um, that being said, um, I think that we have to be protective about what disability justice is, even mm. when disabled people are doing it. Like, it's not like becoming, just like, I mean, just, I've been black my entire life. So it's not like everybody who shares your identity is has a radical positionality on that identity. And I think that that's something um, that, especially in the arts, where there is so little to go around, something that's on my mind. Um, yeah. Lucy, just cause I, I got fired. Um, all right. So oh, you just said 300 words that were all so good. Um, I'm thinking about how in the last year and a half, a lot of the tools and ways of the disabled community to survive, a lot of our survival ways that dominant culture sneered at, dismissed, made incredibly difficult to enact, became what everybody else needed. So our marginalized needs became dominant culture needs. So then for a very short period of time, I was actually in this magic world where my needs were being served in ways they had never been served without me asking for it because everyone had the same need. But now that we're going back to a space where dominant culture was like, oh, I just needed this for a minute. They're dropping it. Um, I also see them, this was like a short period of time where they saw that our ways had value 
And I was like, oh no, this is the dangerous place where they see something that has value. And instead of going, you people make things that are valuable. Mm. I should value you and your ways. Let me give you power. They go, you made a valuable thing. Let me take it and ruin it. And I feel like that's also something that's happening and almost the cultural appropriation of disability justice aesthetics and rhetorics. Oh my gosh, yes. And this, I, so, oh, Crystal, I, were you speaking? I was. Um, you know what? This is what I always say, right? I get lots of invitations. And I say, I'm everybody's checklist, except for LBGQ. Right? I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm disabled, like whatever the flavor of the month is, mm -hmm. I sort of fit in there. But there's some things that I strongly feel about the disability or differently able community is that we don't talk about the racism within this community. Because see, this community is the biggest racist community. I've ever seen. And so I see that some of my colleagues that are considered disabled are getting some serious rewards out of, you know, disability is the latest flavor of the moment. Mm -hmm. right? But when I look at my colleagues that are people of color that are also intelligent, get creative, get amazing, they're still on the back line. And so it's not just how able-bodied or the power structure sees us, it's how we're treated even within our own so-called community. Mm. Um, and that, when you talk about honoring our bodies and ourselves, how can I relate to you, Lucy, right? When you have never experienced a person of color, you have a lot of hostile issues about whatever your disability is. And I come along, you want to treat me not even as a second class, but as a third or fourth or even a physical. And so for me, the struggle is not just outside the community. If we could work together with more of a collective impact, we could take those things, Claudia, that we brought to the forefront and really run with them. But our community is so divided. Um, and within that divide, they are not kind to those of us who are people of color. Yeah. Um, this is right. Oh, sorry, Lucy. Um, just real quick. I think that to me, in my opinion, it's just that we're not a community, you know, like I think um, it's easy to think that anybody who shares like a identity category is automatically a community because words like community have been left undefined for so long, you know, like I think that there's almost this thing um, where you know, because a lot of this, like the talk of community comes from like liberal, I like liberal spaces, like not like radical spaces, but like specifically liberal spaces, is that like, there are certain things that are intentionally left undefined so as to make people feel more comfortable, you know? Mm. So like if we can all feasibly be a disability community, it like means that there's like some baked in solidarity towards each other. Like there's like a built in trust um, but like, I don't know that I personally believe that that is what community is, you know, like I am not in community with white autistics. They be wildin', they be out here doing and saying just what, just whatever, you know, like I think about lupus where it's like 70% people with lupus are black. Um, people who are assigned female at birth, like I am a transgender person, I'm a trans masculine person. Um, that being said, right. Um, why, when I look at like lupus foundation of America, is it all white women? Like why? Like it's just it doesn't make any sense, right? But that's because there is no lupus community, right? Like there are people with lupus. Hopefully people are in the larger disability justice movement. But like the idea of community, I wanna say it like has I hope that it has like a higher standard than that we just happen to be of the same 
identity. And so when I started thinking about it like that, like especially with disability justice, whereas even when you look at the ADA, like it's extremely conservative. It was a compromise with George Bush and Jesse Helms. It was intentionally conservative, it was intentionally racist, it was intentionally homophobic and intentionally transphobic. So what do I have to do with disability rights? I have nothing to fucking do with disability rights. Those weren't my rights. It was only a couple of years ago where they made it easier for people with lupus to apply for SSDI, people kidneys failing, people out here being like any other disabled people, but you can't get it because you have lupus, because you're black, you know? Like, like it's the same thing with a lot of different diseases and conditions. If black people disproportionately get it, if queer people disproportionately get it, if it's gender dysphoria, it's not covered. So who are those people to me? There are no one to me. I've been in disability rights spaces where they said, oh, I wish so-and-so was as good, like disability rights person was as known as Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer had polio as a child and was beaten by cops until her kidneys failed. How much more disabled do you want her to be? No, you just don't want her to be black. You know what I mean? I'm not community with those people. And so once I, I stopped feeling that way, I feel like it made more sense to me personally because no, I'm not in community with every disabled person at all. Yeah, I well, oh, Claudia, please. I, I keep cutting you off, Lucy. Please, please say what you wanted to say. I, I have a response though. No, I, I mean, this is your space. Yay, okay. So um, I want to um, agree with everything you said, but also disagree a little bit because I think that um, one of the things that supremacy culture does is it makes us think that things are just what they are. They're one thing, they're their one defined thing and they can only be that one defined thing. So I think community means a lot of things and is used by different communities to mean and do a lot of different things to and with us. I like to think that there are a lot of different ways to dismantle um, bad systems. And I think we need a lot of them. I think we need the things that weaken them from the inside, that weaken them from the top, and also all of us um, um, weakening them everywhere else. Um, so while I, I fully agree that I'm often in spaces where um, um, white supremacy culture has created frameworks that allow whiteness and racism to be socially accepted and promoted, and then I'm receiving aspects of racism. But I'm also sometimes in spaces where they're supposed, it's supposed to be a space that's about my black liberation. Mm. And I can't get there. They, they've literally designed it. So I can't succeed. And then I have to ask myself, all right, who trained and taught you black man to think that my success as a black woman impedes your ability to succeed. Mm. What taught and trained you, my fellow activists, that you slowing down so that I could march with you made your march less effective? Who told you to design and plan without me in mind? I, I think that this is like the larger supremacy culture thing that's, that, that wants us to be divided and comes up with so many different ways to, to divide us and to convince us that we're that that we don't have collectively shared goals and needs. So I'm agreeing with you, but I think I'm also I feel like we are part of the I I think that unfortunately I'm part of these larger communities, mm. even as they are negative. But every piece of my body is a piece of my body, even the pieces of my body that are trying to kill me right now. It's the same thing with the disability community. It's big, it's gigantic, and some of it's trying to kill me with white supremacy, but we're still part of the same community. That's a Claudia Alec opinion. Well, I so I, I want to jump, I was gonna ask, you know, does, does this work happen inside institutions? Does it happen outside institutions? And I'm interested in, in maybe returning to that question at some point. Um, but I, I want to dream with y'all. Um, there are like a million little light bulbs going off in my head. Claudia, I have had that experience of being the reporter at the protest who cannot keep up with the crowd. Um, and it's really hard. Um, and, and I don't live at as many intersections as folks on this panel and, and just want to honor that. Um, so I, I want a vision with everyone. And Crystal, I want to go to you. You know, let's get crazy, let's get expansive. What can we be doing in, in this world or and, and what do you want to see um, for folks who consider themselves disabled and or differently abled? I know that some people like one term, some people like another term. So, you know, it's funny, right? 
both of you talk about the ADA. So last year I gave a keynote at Emerging Research, somebody, AAAS, some, you know, very elitist, scientific, and I did a workshop for folks got differently able, and I got up and they did the introduction. So one of the leaders in the disability community just got pissed because she spent 15 minutes talking about how I disrespected all of the work, the ADA, how it's listed as disability, mm. and people like me want to come in and change. And I was like, lady, look, evolution is inevitable. We started as colored, get Negro, get Black, and African American. Everybody's got to evolve. And where you were doing a protest 50 years ago, thank you for doing it. But now we have to move forward. For me, I have a saying called, I can't doesn't live here. Right? And I tell everybody. You know, dream whatever it is your dream, because somehow the universe or God or whatever you want to call it, those energies come back to you. You know, Claudia, I have been really blessed. And I think about the African village, right? I think about our ancestors who made something out of nothing. And if there was somebody there that couldn't walk, they didn't leave them. They put together, you know, tree branches and limbs and dragged them along, probably killing them a little bit more. But the point is that you said, who teaches you this? And Cordy, it's really about love. You know, I think about the places I've gone, the places I've been stuck, you know, in Europe, my cane breaks, I'm at a train station, I can't get to the damn train, and there's some dudes out there and I say, hey, and I say, you know what, let us help you. You know, I think about falling down the stairs and um, MJ's bodyguards and him lifting me up and carrying me. But it's about love. It's really about how we're taught to love, how we're taught to love unconditionally. You know, a lot of little kids always want to touch my wheelchair, right? And their parents go, oh, no, 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 don't bother her. Don't, no, let me let you touch the wheelchair. Let me let you see what the leg braces look like. Because the way that we make this change is Yes, make it a big, big noise, writing, doing all that. But it's the love vibration that makes the difference of who you're interacting with. And I just can tell you stories of places where I've been get thinking, oh, God, like, how can I get through this? And somebody says, hey, let me help you. Um, you know, we're going on a trip to Dallas you know, in a, in a, a handicap van that breaks, right? So I'm stuck in the damn van, right? And somebody says, pulls up and says, hey, let me try to help you here. But I really think if people don't want to believe this, what we have to do is create a tsunami of love, right, with ourselves and be a little more patient with those who don't understand because honestly, uh, guys, nobody knows what it's like to really walk in your shoes, right? Nobody knows the pain that your body is really going through, unless it's somebody within that community that has those same issues. So trying to get somebody else to understand, hey, I need this. What we got to speak what we need. Okay, yeah, sweetie, I feel impatient too. But you know what? See, I'll be talking to the nice crystal. Because the other crystal would be like, you know what? Get the fuck up and get it done. Um, but we do have to be patient. You know, just like we want other people to understand what our needs are, 
we have to also understand that they can't even begin to know what it's like. They don't even understand what our needs are. And so we have to verbalize it. But I verbalize my needs with a lot of love vibration and a lot of action. That's just me. So I um, I appreciate that. I've also been reminded by the tech powers that be. Thank you, tech powers that be. Um, just to say, if you're listening to this on the Facebooks, um, drop your questions in the chat. We'll get to them at the end of the conversation. We'll leave time for them. Thank you so much. Um, also, I'm I'm not a so I'm I'm into the love vibration. I'm into leading with grace and empathy. I'm also into fucking it up, right? So I I want to hear a little bit about. Um, you know, Claudia and Saray, for you, for both of you, what do you what do you vision when you think of a world that is accessible to all abilities? Wait, I got to jump in here for a minute. Lucy, you're taking the word love the wrong way. Love is a action. You know, it is not something that is passive, but it is how you, you know, old school, I'm going to call you out and let you know, right? But I want to be about new school. I want to call you in and help you understand what it is that you need to know so that you are more effective. If I can lower your defense mechanism or your ignorances to help you understand. So there we go. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, yeah, I appreciate sorry. that too. Um, yeah, I was one of the co-founders of what was functionally a think tank, the Harriet Tubman Collective. And we worked for years to get the movement for Black Lives to not be a bunch of ableists. And they never did. They never did. No matter how loving we were, no matter how kind we were, no matter how many times we said it. In fact, we gave concrete steps and many of us were people who had been in the movement prior. I was in the uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in um, Philadelphia. Okay, so it wasn't like we were coming from without and you know putting pressure on people who were doing other things. Quite the converse. In fact, the head leaders of that movement um, consistently said they were going to meet with ones of us and ignored us. They duffed us. They ghosted us. Okay, mm -hmm. so where is the love in that? Um, I think that that is also what I mean when I say we are not in community. It's not that we don't share an identity. It's not that we don't share a set of stakes. What it means is that community to me is not something that's cheap. When I think of my community, I think of people who, if I'm going to be beaten in the street, these are the people who's gonna be organizing for me, okay? Like when I think of community, I mean people who understand us as being part of their shared goals. I do not think that we're currently there. I think that ultimately, in the future, I would like for us to be a community. And I think that that starts with, for me, admitting that we are not in community. Um, I think that a higher standard um, is something that I think that we have to hold ourselves to. Um, and I think that, um, you know, some of it is really a generational divide, you know? Like I have been privileged to be, you know, I work for Sins Invalid right now. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, privileged to have been I guess unofficially mentored by, you know, disability rights people and disability justice people, you know, like some of my teachers have been like Simi Linton and also the Electric P.F. Sinesa Marasinga, you know, like I've learned so much from a whole host of people um, and I'm learning so much from the folks at Sins and Valor right now. And so I do understand that, you know, disability rights and, and disability justice are both waves. So mm -hmm. of which, you know, like uh, I'm privileged to have inherited a wave and that work is constructed on work that sometimes I'm like, I don't know why y'all was fucking doing that. I don't know what made you think that, but thank you for doing it because mm -hmm. here I am now doing something different and that's important. Um, that being said, I do think that who is it who gets asked to be patient, right? Like how often are people asked to be patient with the anger of disabled people? How often are people asked to be patient with the anger of trans people or queer people or black people? How often are they asked to be patient? It's always certain groups of people who are already oppressed waiting and waiting. And I think that for me, like I didn't have to wait, but a couple of weeks into the COVID-19 for them to take away my medication like I was a damn dog who could die in the street. Mm. They immediately took away my hydroxychloroquine. They sent people out notices to say, oh, well, the medication stays in your body for 40 days. What does that have to do with me? Okay, I've been on hydroxychloroquine for 10 years. 
You can't just suddenly dislocate me from my medication, right? Like where was the patients there? Where was the patients when doctors and dentists were prescribing my medication to well people? You know, like it was nowhere. They didn't have to be patient for a day. I had to wait weeks to get my medication. Okay, so like me, I, I understand that people have different approaches. I understand that not every disabled person is in the disability justice movement. That's just, it's fine, you know? Like people do different things with different tactics. But I do think that overall, as far as where, like where I am located um, as an artist, I think that there are certain things, particularly when we talk about um, universal healthcare, right? We cannot wait for universal healthcare, we will die. Um, I think that there are plenty of things in a lot of different communities where disabled people end up being marginalized. And I think that sometimes the desire to humanize ourselves, and this is true for trans people as well, like the desire to be human in the eyes of people who hate us and want us dead, it's, it isn't patience, it can be a waste of time because it's not like, you can't make someone think you're human. If someone finds you just unhuman, they, have, they are regarding, in my opinion, the category of humanists and measuring you up against it. Like I am myself an Afro pessimist for sure. Like I don't think that by the current definition of humanity, like I think that black people have been positioned against that category, right? It isn't that we're technically not human in some sort of biological way, but in the way that white people just define the category, we are not what they mean when they say human. It is the same for disabled people. They, we are not what they mean when they have defined their categories. They have defined it against us, right? And so I think that I, in the future for me and like thinking of myself as an eco-poet, I think that one of the things that does for me is like, what other kinds of solidarity opens up? Like if I'm like, okay, so these people don't think of me as being in community with them. They're not gonna fight for me. They don't care about me. They're out here with no fucking masks. They're out here just doing whatever, having big parties, going to raves. These are my own people, right? So if I'm thinking to myself, oh yeah, the queer community. Well, then I look outside and that article that got posted about right at the beginning of the pandemic about going to Fire Island as some sort of queer political act. It was like, we're not in community. How about that? Well, who am I in community with? I'm in community with orca whales, right? I'm in community with the earth itself, which is being disabled by greed, um, being broken apart and heated up. I'm in community with the earth. I'm in community with the animals, the plants. I'm in community with other people like myself, for sure. You know, like people who actually love me, people who are staying home, <laughs> people who are wearing masks. I'm in community with them. And I don't necessarily share identity groups with them. You know, like I don't, I don't necessarily share identity groups with them. Um, you know, like I am not an orca whale. I am not a blade of grass. I am not a tree. But I think that we share a goal. And in that way, I, I want to protect them. I believe that the earth wants to protect me too. And, you know, that's a deep spiritual thing for me. I am a Hoodoo practitioner. I was raised in the AME church. It is an animist tradition. And so when I think about like, where's my community? Like who's there for me, right? Like the plants right now, they're breathing out energy that I get to breathe in, right? Like there are people out there who are, you know, organizing for justice. There are people out there who are living lives similar to my own and considering me in their actions. And those people are my community. I don't think that it has to be about identity. I, I really don't. I, I think that identity in some ways, it's slippery, right? Like, cause like when we get into this big pot, right? Like, do we really all share the same oppressions within this pot? You know, like, I will, like I'm an autistic person who went through ABA. I meet people all the time where like, they're making graphics about whether or not the, the spectrum is a line or a circle. Like, I don't care. I don't care. I do not care. I don't care. And I don't know, like, it's not that I hate them. I don't hate them. I want them to succeed. I like the graphic, you know, like maybe that's important. I don't know. But like, uh -huh. this, like autistic kids are getting shocked to death and, and restrained to death in schools, right? Like that is still happening. I don't care if it's if the, the spectrum is a circle or a line. I don't care. So I, that's what I mean when I say that I don't think that we're all in community, right? Like. Yeah. What other opportunities are there for solidarity if we don't think of ourselves as being inherently in community? What if what if community isn't possible in the way that we mm. think? Like, I think that there are other ways to think about what's going on. I, I want to go to Claudia because I know that that she's been holding a thought. Well, well, well this is this is a hundred percent response to you, Cyrie. So I've been with you this entire time. I'm thinking that it's not about being in the community, like I'm in a physical place. Like this is the community, and I'm inside of it. It's acting in community and it's acting from a positionality that considers yourself to have the same core needs. Um, so that's why you can have a lot of black folks doing anti-black things in public because they are acting on behalf of the community that they're acting on behalf of, which is rich people, people with power. They're yeah. acting to maintain power for people with power and that requires enacting anti-blackness. 
So I go, oh, how can we create conditions that force people to act in community? How can I make your life impossible to um, live well without making sure I live well? How can I create those circumstances? Um, how can I refuse to allow a space to frame itself in a way that would let me be hurt or harmed inside of it? How can I just refuse to let that be? So I, I will I will name that I'm the person who put into our into our group chat. I'm impatient, um, and I think I said that because. Um, Oftentimes, communities will say, oh my gosh, I had no idea that those were the outcomes of the things that I've been doing my entire life and that you have been fighting for generations to stop this nonsense. I had no idea. I'm, I was ignorant and therefore I'm innocent. I don't need to feel guilt. I don't have to have bad feelings about myself or anybody else. And maybe I don't even have to change. Maybe you could just say words and teach and change me with mm. your words. And I go, that's a grift. I know I've been living through that for the last what? Well, my entire like like I think that I've tried that real hard. The let's educate people out of ignorance so that they can change. And um, what happens is that they go, oh, my gosh, we're going to make laws that make it illegal for you to teach anti-racism. That's what doing what we do so well has done. But it does tell me that what we do actually is working so, like the entire CRT nonsense. I go, oh, that's taking place because that patient teaching was actually effective and having impact. So Crystal, thank you for reminding me that there is strength in that patience, even as I am patiently holding the line or patiently pushing us just an inch forward. Um, I, I am grateful to at least be able to have the ADA to work off of. And the ADA, I think about the Black Panther Party and like the white white disabled activists and Black Panther disabled yeah. activists fighting together to get basic rights so that I can get on a bus, so I can go do a job, so I can actually live my life. So for that rights thing, I, I go, oh, it's not enough. The ADA was never enough. We need something bigger and better, but I think that's what we're growing and getting into. You know what, we need something bigger and better. And guys, you know, maybe you really need to google me because you took the word patient wrong um believe me you took the word patient very wrong um look i'm a filmmaker can i have committed my life to changing the narrative and that is how we begin to change how we perceive ourselves and how other people perceive us get in changing the matter the narrative we have got to use multimedia because that's what people buy into. So when you look at, I mean, I'm writing these damn people every year. A kiss begins with K, right? So tell me why there is not a black woman on the commercial getting the diamond, right? Mm -hmm. I've been married 32 years to a black man who won me diamonds. So how come I am not represented in that commercial? And so there are things that we do every day that changes that needle. No, I don't think that I am a big part of the National Organization of Disabilities, right? But I am part of a community that is made up of people that are differently able. But we are multidimensional people that I do not allow that small part of my life that small community to define what community I live in. I live in lots of communities. I live in a sisterhood. I live in a film community, which I actually like better than any community that I interact with. But each of us are doing things to change the narrative. And that is how you change people's belief systems. And so when people look at my work, which a lot of it does have to do with social justice issues um you get to i want to take you on a journey right i want to show you something i want you to experience something but at the end you i hope open up your eyes a little bit uh, to see the world differently get to see me or those like me differently so each of us are doing our own thing to move this needle 
and Claudia, listen, I in a heartbeat will do something really crazy because I am not a patient person. Mm. What I have realized is looking at the work that Fannie Lou Hamer did and laid the ground made it possible for me to be who I am today. And that we are laying a groundwork for the next generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that, just one quick thing, sorry, sorry Lucy. I think that it's like really important, Claudia, that you brought up the five and four sit-ins because that's kind of my concern yeah. with um, with patients, right? Like the five and four sit-ins were in 77. And so the Panthers, folks from five and four sit-ins, united together. By 1990, we we're passing this racist bill, the ADA. Yeah. So like, yeah. it's just like we just march forward on like a tide of promise. Um, I think about even like the like example of a diamond, right? Like. COVID was a mass disabling event. When we mm. think about like even something like diamond mines, right? Like that is a disabling, those are disabling conditions that disable black people, right? So like for me, like I can't say that like, that's the thing that concerns me, even as a poet, right? Like the patrician yeah. art, right? Like I'm not gonna pretend like it doesn't take a lot of money or even like I went to Columbia, right? Like I don't think that my hands are clean in this, right? Like I do assimilation and shit all the time, right? Like that abs absolutely, or else I would have absolutely no career. Right, like it's not like a purity politic, right? Like I think especially among black people, like we're all just trying to survive a world that hates us and would like to destroy us. Um, and the choices that we make in that are the choices that we make in that, right? Like I went to Columbia because I knew that I would have a better chance of getting a job if my name, Saray, with an accent on the first E and my trans body, we're gonna have an easier time if I went to Columbia. So I went to Columbia, right? Like it wasn't from like some sort of high-minded change the institution from within, it was incredibly cynical. And, you know, like, I, I get that. But like, at the same time, right, like, representation only gets us so far because representation and what is acceptable representation comes from those who have the most power, right? So like, when mm -hmm. I, like, even as a trans person, like, decide I, you know, like, I would like to make a diamond commercial, right? Like, I am implicated and, you know, culpable for the fact that little kids are getting their hands cut off to mine diamonds and they are black children in Africa. Like, I don't know how we reconcile those things. And I don't know that that puts us in a larger community and like what international solidarity means in that context. May I ask a question though? Cause I'm wondering now, and this I'm hoping actually leads into what you're trying to get us to Lucy. So, um, cause I've been struggling to, I've been struggling to um, create um, projects that are centered on disabled justice, centered on um, anti-racism, and aren't um, infected by the dominant culture paradigms. It's so hard. I, it feels impossible at times where I'm busy doing, um, like there's a project called Disrep that I've been doing with the Curiosity Paradox. And we're in the middle of doing it. And one of our participants, it's designed and led by all disabled people. Um, I but one of our, and it's almost majority disabled people participating, designing accessibility, but one of our participants can't fully participate because they're so disabled, they need pro-tactile um, sign language and we can't afford it. It would take the entirety of the budget. And so even in the disabled justice led space for and building accessibility, we enacted a moment of disabled injustice because of capitalism and the larger systems that we're a little trapped in. I'm currently producing a production of Electra. The production team, all dis I don't know if we're all disabled, but it's majority disabled production team, like from the producers to everybody. Um, um, the, the director is, di is directing with a decolonized directorial style with the um, aesthetics of accessibility. Um, and I feel like potentially within the framework of what we're doing, we have the ability to find some ways to do it better. I think we're still doing a bunch of stuff that hurts and harms us because we're doing something that's that's inside of supremacy. Anything we do inside supremacy culture has has pieces of it on it. So I I know that my experience and my performer's experience is not going to be perfect, but I'm hoping at the end of it, we're going to know how to demand better, and mm. possibly people will be able to see what we've done and go, oh we can do something that's better than that. You know what, Claudia? I think that we're missing something here. 
and uh, uh, you know, I gave the example of the diamonds as a commercial, um, but I think that what we're missing here is that we live in an ecosystem. And that same superior power system does have really great people. And there are great able-bodied people. And the moment that we feel like we have to do this, and we have people with disabilities by themselves, can we begin to exclude other groups? Um, we are setting up the same dichotomy, dichotomy in a way. Um, you know, hey, I'm a filmmaker. I hire the best people that work for me. Yes, one of them has lupus. There's two women that you know, one walks in the cave. Um, I don't think that we need to insulate ourselves. We need to move with it. We need to meet people where they are and find those people that have those resources that can then leverage them, that they become our resources and meet people where they are. You know, there is somebody that understands they may have had a grandchild or a wife or someone that has somebody that says, okay, you know what? Let me help you guys this way with this type of donation. But that's somebody that is not necessarily a person that is disabled. But I just think that we got to think more to be more inclusive. Now, I come from a traditional black family, by the way. Okay, so, you know, you come to our house for Sunday for dinner, you're just gonna see regular black people. Um, but the wonderful thing about how I was raised was that everybody in our neighborhood was part of our family. And that we can do more with collective impact than we can do with little groups. And I think that that is where we have to move towards um, changing the narrative. And that narrative changes differently according to what your personalized experience is, what makes you loud, makes you bold, but also understanding that other people have disabilities that you just don't see. And one of them is understanding what our world looks like. You know, and I'm just gonna tell this. I wrote a podcast, I did a podcast, and it was called The Coochie Chronicles, right? So what the hell is The Coochie Chronicles about? It's about getting a bath, right? Like how many people understand what it's like when you're a quadriplegic because somebody else has to wash your body, right? And how violating that could be with the, the kindest person, right? Somebody that's there to take care of you. But what that, why I did that podcast was because people really don't understand what it looks like or that experience is. Okay, that is where I say patience is required. Um, but action, Every day we take action. Because my company is called You Are You the Right to Me. You have the right to me and I got the right to be because I got the right to kick your ass if you get in my way. But the point being is we're all different. You know, every, each of us up here in this channel are very different. And as long as we keep chipping and breaking at those rocks, we're moving. We might not move as fast as we want to, but we're moving. So that's it for me. Yes. I, um, I want to ask, so Emily Mayo, who is in the audience. Hi, Emily. Um, she said her question was answered, but I disagree, actually. <laughs> and um, and, and um, the question is, you know, how, how can folks who claim to be allies, and I would add that I'm thinking of this also in the fact that like anti-racism, I see anti-racism work um, as intimately intertwined with disability justice. Um, how can folks who are claiming to be allies step 
back up against this because I will say we had 5,000 people marching in the streets last summer. We had about 12 last week when uh, an incident went down with the Board of Education and there was a teacher who said some um, very racist things. And so um, how can allies be stepping up and, and what does that look like? Pray little Lucy, if you only had 12 people, y'all didn't market it the right way, okay? Because people are looking for something to, everybody's angry, right? So people are looking for something to march to the, you know, there's professional the marchers and students. Um, but go ahead, Claudia, I see you. Yeah, you saw me. I was like, I'm thinking, I think I got a response. But I also yeah. like, I, I have a response about inclusion and representation that I, I actually do want to get to that, that ties together some of the um, uh, beautiful um, observations, um, uh, Syrie, you were making around um, um, uh, black pessimism um, and, and ugh. but advice for other people. This is what you need to do. I, Claudia's advice for y'all. Guess what? This is an everyday thing. Turns out if your garden has weeds, you don't weed, like have a hardcore weeding celebration or party or protest, and then you're done and you don't have weeds anymore. This is the United States. It was founded on slavery. We are suffering right now because we've inherited a lot of horrible structures and the current dominant power structures are forcing us to maintain them and to maintain the lie that they're good and they work. It's really a gaslighting situation. It's horrible. So you have to remember and remind all of your friends that they have to work on this every single day. The reason that 50,000 people came out last year was because they'd never come out before. And they were like, whoa, I'm going to do it for the first time. I did it. Wow, that was hard. I'm tired now. I want to go back to normal. Why isn't it back to normal? I feel like I failed because the world didn't fully change. Mm. We're going to all have to work real hard for a while to get this to shift and change. So I think one of the biggest things you're gonna to need to do is be each other's cheerleaders, be each other's pep squads, and make sure people don't get you know stuck in that depressive place that supremacy culture wants you to be stuck in that goes, oh yeah, no, this is the only way it can be. You might as well just sit down and watch Law and Order. Uh, you know what, Claudia? It's called translation fatigue. Let me tell you, conversations, Everybody wanting to go out and do something. Translation for tea. Well, let's hear from Sir Ray. Uh, since I'm glad you put it in the chat because I screw up everybody's name. Um, I think you should give money to individual disabled people. Um, GoFundMe is one of the largest, like some ridiculous percent of GoFundMe's are for medical expenses. We still don't have universal health care. Um, if you are an ally to disabled people, you will put money in the hands of individual disabled people. Um, I think that it feels good to march, like, I guess, like, march if there's, like, something that's going on or, you know, like, but I think that sometimes folks who want to be in solidarity with disabled people don't understand how much they don't understand. Yeah. I think that that is what I also mean when I say that I don't think that we're one coherent community. And, like, there's such a long way for us to go because, like, even thinking about for so long through disability rights. And like, look, this is the, I, it could have been the best framework at the time, right? Like things were siloed in individual foundations. So you have the Muscular Dystrophy Foundation, you have the Down Syndrome Foundation, you got the Lucas Foundation of America, you got this one and that one, all of these, you know, ASOs, all of these organizations atomized, not working together. And so you might know something about, like you might have a, a sibling with Down's syndrome, you know, but like that doesn't necessarily mean you know anything about like congenital blindness or nor do I, you know, like, I think that like, that's the reason why I say like one of the best things that you can do is to start a mutual aid effort. There was just um, the disabled elders mutual aid effort that was going to give uh, money to individual, like 10 individual disabled elders. Like those are the kinds of things that I'd like to see people who want to be in solidarity doing. We are one of the poorest minorities. We are the largest minority. Right. And so like, if you want to make a difference on the day to day, like, fund somebody's surgery, like give somebody some money. Yeah. I need to add to that though. You know what? It's uh, the same, uh, buy a man a sandwich, he eats that day, teaching a fish. It is really about policy. 
And this is what I say that those that are in places of perceived power, because I have an issue with that whole word power, but perceived power, that it is also about policy. It is those policies that survey kept you from getting your medicine because somebody else had something else that they wanted to put there. Um, Caught in policy, policy changes. Um, that is where real change happens. And yes, you know, people write a check. Shit, somebody out there write a check to me right now. I would be very grateful. Um, but it's not just writing a check. It really is being fully engaged um, because it's just going to take a lot for us to get to the next phase. But I have hope. Like, you know, every day I see amazing transformations with people that I would have never thought. And some of them took 30 years. I'm telling you, one person 30 years. But what is time? Really, right? You know, if you want to like go metaphysically, what is time? It's a way that we measure our day to day, but you know, the planet's been here a long time. And we're gonna be here a long time. So I I know that we are winding down. Um Sorry, I also want to thank you for the beautiful reminder of mutual aid. I know in New Haven, but I think across the country, a lot of groups showed up and did collective care work um, in ways that were really beautiful and in also in ways that should not have to be necessary, um, but, but are, at, at least in the city, because the nonprofit industrial complex is such a presence in the city and because wealth um, is concentrated in the hands of so few. Um, Claudia, I want to make sure that you have time to speak before we before we are booted out. I could speak with all of you for probably four or five hours. So, I will say that having gatherings like this is part of moving the needle forward. This exchange with you, Crystal, um, Saray, uh, please make sure I'm actually pronouncing your name correctly. I'm realizing I made friends with you digitally and have fully memorized your name in the way I imagined it pronounced. Um, so apologies. Um, I, I just feel like your all of your comments and ideas have helped me move the needle forward for the mm. way I'm thinking about this. Um, but, but one of the big ideas that I'm having right now is around, I don't like the word inclusion because it makes me think that, oh, I don't get to change what dominant culture is or make a new dominant culture that's better for all of us. I can be included in what they're doing and they're willing to shift or change tiny things to include me. And I'm like, oh, I don't wanna be included in your poisonous nonsense. Don't, me inclu don't include me in that. How about we do something better and different together? So I've been really resistant to the word inclusion, but I think that's because it feels like it's inviting me inside something I don't want to be inside of. I think I'm imagining us building um, something that's better and broader and more gigantic. So okay, like, so Claudia, come on this. Come yes. On so, so when you're, chemistry. Yes. So when you're talking about like the um, um, uh, representation and how representation is not enough, it's never enough because who's writing, who's deciding what story is going to be distributed to the largest number of people, who's writing that story, who's producing yeah. that story. It's almost always an abled dominant culture framework. And then we're being included in it as a piece of representation. It has, it does have impacts. Representation matters. It feels good to be able to see yourself and know I exist. I'm not being erased by dominant culture, but right now, representation is not enough. I don't want to be included in dominant culture. I want to make something bigger and better than what we have now. For sure. Like inclusion and colonization is sort of how we got here, right? Like that's the major failure of the Obama presidency. Like the idea that we want a black president is embarrassing to me. Why would we want a black slaver on a world scale? Like that does not make coherent sense to me. Um, ultimately, I'm an autonomist. I don't think that policy, like sure, like policy on a day to day has effects on my life, that's true. Um, but making more policy is not necessarily going to positively affect my life. Um, I think that there are definitely 
exceptions to that rule. But I think that the problem with it is not, no law would ever improve my life. That's not what I think. I think that ultimately the people who currently make the laws are mostly people who have never even met someone like me. Like they don't know anything about my life. And the representatives that we ask to be at those tables, I've seen them, you know, some <laughs> like uh, frequently are going to be people who agree with power, right? They agree with the, those who are in the dominant position or else they wouldn't have been invited around. I think that the solution is ultimately, or like what I believe ultimately is that like, as long as the white supremacist state that enslaved us is here, it is not in their best interest to dismantle ableism. It's not in their best interest to dismantle white supremacy, right? Like, why would they do that? It it profits them, right? Like, without white supremacy, like, who would they enslave in prisons to make cheap goods to keep ca capitalism flowing? Like, who would they do? Like, who would they coerce into low wage jobs if not black people? Like, we've been reduced to the underclass. So, like, I or even like thinking about disabled people, right? Like, sheltered workshops. Like, what would they do if disabled people were equal and you had to pay them a living wage? Like, that would not suit them. They're not going to do that. Like there's no amount of policy that's gonna make whole um, what America needs to be unwhole. And so I think for myself personally, I do believe that mutual aid is a more sustainable long-term goal that we can use whatever resources that we have to truly help each other and be in community with one another than thinking that our government is gonna like start suddenly like take off its face and it's gonna be a black person under like a white face mask. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we're gonna get the things that, that we need. Maybe that will happen. I'm not saying, I certainly don't know what the future holds in that regard. It could be anything, right? Like it, it truly could be anything. But so far as I can tell, white supremacy, ableism, transphobia, homophobia, it is all in reinforcement of a white supremacist patriarchy that makes people a lot of money. And we are a capitalist country. Money talks, bullshit walks. So no, I don't think that, that the government is gonna come in and suddenly become better. I think that we are going to have to help each other. Yeah, um, oh, I I feel like I could continue this for a very long time, but I do want to say just Claudia and and you made this light bulb sort of ping in my head, um, as 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 a member of the media, the big scary media, um, but but also someone who writes those stories, I think that too often there is also a focus on trauma among folks who have disabilities, especially if they live at multiple intersections. And we're not seeing stories of joy as well, uh, joy, community care. Um, and, and so thank you for um, putting out that reminder and, and also speaking with all of you has given me so much joy in this conversation. I think we are just about out of time. Um, so I want to thank all of you there are links in the chat um, so the audience can buy books. They can find out more about these amazing um, multimedia artists who are before me right now. And I really, um, I really appreciate that we've been together in this virtual space. Thank you all so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Nearing. I use she, her pronouns. I am the curator of ideas programs here at the festival. And this is our, our final week of digital programming. And it has been a blessing this last hour 15 to get to, to be in space and digital space with all of you and all of your wisdom. Um, it is, uh, it is, there's so much dreaming and ideating happening in my brain. I like sit behind the scenes in these panels screaming and laughing and like cheering you on. Um, and I'm so appreciative. I am sitting so much, uh, Saray, with the with what you said, um, that we're just going to have to help each other. We're going to have to help each other. And thinking about um, care work, you mentioned Leah uh, Lakshmi Piepsna Simrasena, um, and uh, their book Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice is something that, that has deeply changed my life. Um, uh, and there was a, a little quote I wanted to share with y'all, if that's cool, as a, as a way of closing, um, with this is two, two quotes sort of pieced together from the book. It's a disability justice framework understands that all bodies are unique and essential, that all bodies have strengths and needs that must be met. It means that we are not left behind. We are beloved, kindred, needed. Um, so that's from care work. Uh, thank you all so much. We have more programs to come. You, you can check them all out at 
artidea.org. Uh, the link will pop up below with our magical technical geniuses behind the scenes. Um, and uh, you can take a survey, tell us how we're doing. There it is, look, amazing. Um, we can uh, take a survey, let us know how we're doing. Tell us your stories in the audience. We wanna hear from you. Um, it's at artidea.org slash survey. Uh, and we'll be out on the green um, uh, both virtually and in person. Um, so please listen to music with us, celebrate joy, uh, call for justice. Let's let's make some magic together. Thank you, Lucy, Claudia, Saray, uh, and Crystal. Thank you to Nick and Anita for signing with us um, and to all of you watching. Hope to see you soon. Have a great night.